The Sound of Music, reviewed by Pauline Kael. Published in The New Republic, December 21, 1965. The Singing Nun will make you realize how good Fred Zinnemann's The Nun's Story was. Although the theme, the conflict, and even the storyline are similar, The Singing Nun reduces them to smiles, twinkles, banalities, and falseness. It is almost a parody of the nun's story, and, of course, without the courage of the conclusion of that earlier thoughtful, subtle film. Though the singing nun draws its ideas from the nun's story, its inspiration is obviously that movie phenomenon the trade press now refers to, very respectfully, as the sound of money. And perhaps to get at what goes on in a movie like The Singing Nun, we need to look at that phenomenon, which is so often called wholesome, but which is probably going to be the single most repressive influence on artistic freedom in movies for the next few years. The success of a movie like The Sound of Music makes it even more difficult for anyone to try to do anything worth doing, anything relevant to the modern world anything inventive or expressive. The banks, the studios, the producers will want to give the public what it seems to crave. The more money these wholesome movies make, the less wholesome will the state of American movies be. The opium of the audience, Luis Bunel, the Spanish director once said, is conformity and nothing is more degrading and ultimately destructive to artists than supplying the narcotic. What is it that makes millions of people buy and like the sound of music, a tribute to freshness that is so mechanically engineered, so shrewdly calculated, that the background music rises, the already soft focus blurs and melts, and upon the instant you can hear all those noses blowing in the theater. Of course, it's well done for what it is. That is to say, those who made it are experts at manipulating responses. They're the Pavlovs of movie-making. They turn us into dogs that salivate on signal. When the cruel father sees the light and says, You've brought music back into this house. Who can resist the pull of the emotions? It's that same tug at the heartstrings we feel when Lassie comes home, or when the blind heroine sees for the first time. It is a simple variant of that surge of warmth we feel when a child is reunited with his parents. It's basic, and there are probably few of us who don't respond. But it is the easiest and perhaps the most primitive kind of emotion that we are made to feel. The worst despots in history, the most cynical purveyors of mass culture, respond at this level and may feel pleased at how tender-hearted they really are, because they do. This kind of response has as little to do with generosity of feeling as being stirred when you hear a band has to do with patriotism. I think it is not going too far to say that when an expensive product of modern technology, like The Sound of Music, uses this sort of universal appeal, it is because nothing could be safer, nothing could be surer. Whom could it offend? Only those of us who, despite the fact that we may respond, loathe being manipulated in this way and are aware of how self-indulgent and cheap and ready-made are the responses we are made to feel. And we may become even more aware of the way we have been used and turned into emotional and aesthetic imbeciles when we hear ourselves humming those sickly goody-goody songs. The audience for a movie of this kind becomes the lowest common denominator of feeling, a sponge. The heroine leaves the nuns at the fence as she enters the cathedral to be married, squeezed again, and the moisture comes out of thousands, millions of eyes and noses. And the phenomenon at the center of the monetary phenomenon 
Julie Andrews, with the clean, scrubbed look and the unyieldingly high spirits, the good sport who makes the best of everything, the girl who's so unquestionably good that she carries this one dimension like a shield, the perfect, perky schoolgirl, the adorable tomboy, the gawky colt, sexless, inhumanly happy, the sparkling maid, a mind as clean and well-brushed as her teeth. What is she? Merely the ideal heroine for the best of all possible worlds. And that's what the sound of music pretends we live in. Audiences are transported into a world of operetta cheerfulness and calendar art. You begin to feel as if you've never got out of school. Up there on the screen, they're all in their places with bright shining faces. Wasn't there perhaps one little Von Trapp who didn't want to sing his head off, or who screamed that he wouldn't act out little glockenspiel routines for Papa's party guests, or who got nervous and threw up if he had to get on a stage? No, nothing mars this celebration of togetherness. Not only does this family sing together, they play ball together. This is the world teachers used to pretend, and maybe still pretend, was the real world. It's the world in which the governess conquers all. It's the big lie, the sugar-coated lie that people seem to want to eat. They even seem to think they should feed it to their kids, that it's healthy, wonderful family entertainment. And this is the sort of attitude that makes a critic feel that maybe it's all hopeless. Why not just send the director, Robert Wise, a wire? You win. I give up. Or rather, we both lose. We all lose. Yet there was a spider on the valentine, the sinister, unpleasant, archly decadent performance Christopher Plummer gives as the Baron, he of the thin, twisted smile, my candidate for the man least likely to be accepted as a hero. Even the monstrously ingenious technicians who made this movie couldn't put together a convincing mate for Super Goody Two-Shoes. The dauntless heroine surmounts this obstacle. In the romantic scenes, she makes love to herself, and why not? We never believed for a moment that love of marriage would affect her or change her. She was already perfection. Debbie Reynolds, as the character based on Sokur Sorer in The Singing Nun, is less than perfection. Her eyes are not so clear and bright. Indeed, they're rather anxious, and, yes, almost bleary. And her singing isn't pure and pretty. It's sort of tacky and ordinary. So is the whole production. Henry Coster doesn't succeed even in making it very convincingly wholesome. The religion is a familiar kind of Hollywood Christianity. The nuns are even more smiley and giggly, like a mush-headed schoolteacher's dream of ideally happy school children. Ricardo Montalban is a simperingly simple priest, and although Agnes Moorhead plays a nun like a witch, she is more than balanced by Greer Garson as the mother prioress. With her false eyelashes and her richly condescending manner, Greer Garson can turn any line of dialogue into incomparable cant. It's a gift of a kind. The people in The Singing Nun behave like the animals in a Disney movie. They are so cute and so full of little tricks. There are chintzy little pedagogical songs that are supposed to be full of joy, and there is Debbie's excruciating humility. I have a lot to learn, she tells us, but we didn't really need to be told. She gives up her singing career, which was giving her too much attention and adoration, in order to find her simple faith again. And so, at the end, we see her working as a nurse in Africa, posed like a Madonna holding a Negro baby, surrounded by attentive, adoring Africans. But then, of course, this movie is the kind of spiritual exercise in which the nuns say a little prayer for Ed Sullivan every day. Why am I so angry about these movies? Because the shoddy falseness of The Singing Nun and the luxuriant falseness of The Sound of Music are part of the sentimental American tone that makes honest work almost impossible. It is not only that people who accept this kind of movie tend to resent work that says that this is not the best of all possible worlds, but that people who are gifted give up the effort to say anything. 
they attune themselves to the sound of music. Oh, and thank you for listening.